Welcome back to the Startup Operators Weekly Roundup. The Weekly Roundup is a show for people who want to stay updated with what's happening within the startup ecosystem. Now, last week, One Cards and Fire's entry into the coveted Unicorn Club, alongside Lightspeed Ventures fundraising, made the biggest startup headlines from the week. But before we get started, if you're new to the podcast, don't forget to hit subscribe and the like button so that more people like you can discover our content. So even though it has been a pretty lukewarm week within the Indian startup ecosystem, for the Indian sports scene, it has been a great couple of days. Last week, PV Sindhu clinched her maiden Singapore Open title. And uh, we have Murli Shishankar, who becomes the first ever Indian to qualify for the men's long jump final at the World Championships. Pretty amazing. I think India's uh, sporting prowess is only going to improve. Last week was interesting. I think the biggest headline from my perspective was the fact that, you know, RBI allowed and in fact pushed for settlement of international trade in rupee. You you know, last few roundups we've been talking about you know, UPI being internationalized, India trying to develop an alternative for SWIFT. All of these is in context with what's happening with Russia. You know, after the sanctions, Russia was disbarred from the SWIFT network. Aside from that, $300 billion of their assets was frozen. So all of this means that, you know, I mean, countries across the world are looking to hedge from the dollar as a reserve currency, right? Now, this is pretty damn interesting. So if India and Russia have to trade, and of course, uh, Russia is one of the key import partners for India. Now, if they have to trade, I mean, they can uh, trade directly using Vostro and Nostro accounts, right? So basically, earlier, every trade involved a US bank entity which held dollars and the settlement would happen between these US banks. And you can imagine multiple banks, multiple transaction charges, fairly complex. But now with these Vostro and Nostro accounts, Indians can trade with Russians almost directly, right? In rupee and ruble. I think that's a fantastic thing. It's not going to have as much of an economic impact, I would say. And I don't think it will really threaten the dollar hegemony, but it's a good signal to say that, hey, I mean, we're going to put our interests first, right? I mean, you've heard Dr. Jayashankar, who's the external minister, talk about this at various forums that India will have to put its values and interests first. So it's a fantastic move. uh, It also strengthens the value of rupee with all these local recessions that are going on if you look at what's happening in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Absolutely. So in this case, I mean, we don't have to give aid to Sri Lanka in dollars, right? I mean, we don't have to use that. I mean, we can directly help them through rupee. And of course, Sri Lanka can import some of the stuff that India has using rupee as a currency itself instead of dollars, which they don't have in any way, right? So overall, I think it's a good thing. And and look at our trade with UAE as well. We don't need dollars on that aspect as well. So yeah, I mean, a lot of very, very interesting geopolitical shifts are happening, which is going to impact the economy. And then by extension, it's going to impact startups as well. All right. So in its path to profitability, an academy has uh, announced a series of cost cutting measures to turn profitable before it goes public. The cost cutting measures are going to come in the form of no free meals or snacks. Founders and top management will be taking a pay cut and no business class travels or dedicated drivers for CXO. With everything that's going on, do measures like this actually help in bringing down capital costs for the company? So it's a great signaling effect. It's not really going to affect the bottom line that much. Gaurav Munjal himself had said in that Slack uh, thread, you know, they have 2000 crores or something in the bank already, right? But but these are important to show people that, hey, I mean, there is this focus of being profitable and, you know, going IPO in the next couple of years. Some of these things, I mean, I don't know why they were there in the first place, right? I mean, this yeah, is what I mean, happens dedicated when Dedicated drivers for yeah. the XOs, I mean. Yeah, really. <laughs> So <laughs> I understand a bit of this, right? I mean, because obviously CXO time, energy, bandwidth is really important. I always advocate that, you know, senior leadership, founders, they have to travel business class, right? Because again, it's really, really worth it. You don't want someone who's making the most important decisions in your company to be super tired because energy is finite and you really want them to conserve all of that. So yeah, I mean, it's it's important. Google was one of the first to sort of do this, right? I mean, free meals, laundry and all of that stuff. And that has kind of flowed downstream from there to plenty of the yeah. other startups as well, right? Some of this stuff, I think, is just a bit excess, uh, I would say. But it's a good signaling uh, mechanism, right? And given that the funding cycle has turned, they will also have a lot of pressure, right? I mean, obviously, investors are going to question every line item of expense and say, hey, do we really need this at this point of time? So it's a natural course correction, I would say. Nothing to be alarmed of. Also, the other thing is, See, frugality is something which has to be very intrinsic to a DNA of an organization. It's difficult if you're used to excesses, to then course correct, right? It's just intuitively you realize that if you travel, 
by cars or flights or whatever i mean it's that much more difficult for you to like adjust to public transport after a while right yeah, that's right uh, because humans always get used to the best level uh, you know and going back on some of these things is difficult but let's see i mean they will have to make the change i suppose and yeah, probably for the better in addition to that they also are uh, looking deeper into their books i think they are shutting down their global test prep program as well which really did not make much money okay let's talk about the unicorns that came in last week one was of course one card that raised 100 million dollars from Temasek, QED, Sequoia Capital, Hummingbird Ventures at a valuation of 1.4 billion dollars. The second startup to attain unicorn status last week was Fire that became India's 105th unicorn and they backed 100 million dollars in its Series A funding round from UK based conglomerate SRAM and MRAM. Fire is the third Indian origin startup to become a unicorn at a Series A stage. Previously, I think it was of businesses lending arm Oxizo and a tech company uh, Physics Waller that became a unicorn when it raised 200 million and 100 million dollars in Series A respectively. Yeah, I mean, uh, Fire is, uh, it's it's a pretty interesting sort of a business, right? I mean, uh, they've been around for six months apparently and they did a 21 million dollar round before this. 100 million dollar Series A, you know, we're just talking yeah. about the funding winter and the growth stage funding drying up. Well, this is definitely an aberration. The founder Pratik has been pioneering this concept of a fifth industrial revolution uh, and, and that's where the name fire comes from, right? He's loosely calling it that, you know, I mean, if you do good for the world, I mean, that translates to monetary benefits as well. So when we talk about crypto, Web3, all of that stuff, right? I mean, I think it's important for us to separate these things out right separate the blockchain innovation from cryptography from you know some of the coins and currencies and the assets that you kind of see right i mean although i mean obviously there are a lot of overlaps in this fire is pioneering this kind of a blockchain which uses proof of fire right i mean they call it proof of fire and not proof of state or proof of work as you know a consensus in that chain right so basically what they say is that how sustainable are you right i mean un has this charter on sustainability and if you're adhering to this kind of a sustainable practice like you know it, it could be environmentally sensitive it could be promoting uh, gender diversity and so on then you get some x number of uh, benefits as against someone who's not right this i mean so all, this is all tied up to the un's uh, sdg goals right? correct they're yeah. tied up to the un's sdg goals and they're using that as a sort of a metric in terms of their chain right and there have multiple different use cases the founder has said you know that they're working with the nigerian agriculture ministry and they're also working with the you know police departments in parts of india and they're working with the some university education uh, institutes and so on. Yeah, a lot of different use cases because if you look at blockchain itself, I mean, it's a fundamental innovation, right? And it's good to see these innovations surface. I mean, because we made the point when we spoke about Vault and crypto last time that there's just entirely too much focus on the price action and the coins and the IPOs or ICOs and so on, right? I mean, it's good to kind of see that you know, there, there's core innovation that's the focus. 100 million seems like a hell of a lot, but also, I mean, you know, they will have to invest in so many different uh, use cases, mm -hmm. developing all of them. And plus, I mean, the fact that, you know, talent is pretty scarce. They're coding on solidity, apparently, uh, right? Which is, again, a very finite skill set. Uh, not too many people have that, uh, you know, experience and expertise. So all of that put together, I think this money is basically to build out, you know, multiple use cases, really prove multiple businesses on different axes for anything that uh, blockchain can solve definitely interesting but um, also uh, what was what really stood out for me from this fundraise was that with this fundraise they're going to expand into three continents right asia europe and america and despite that they want to keep india as the base for all operations i think 70 percent of its workforce is based in india yeah. and with the sort of work fire is doing with sort of work companies like polygon are doing setting up the entire crypto infrastructure i think yeah. like how in india you're building in india but selling to the world i think very soon india will become a hotspot for crypto also absolutely i think india perhaps has one of the largest uh, ecosystems for crypto at least the talent that's also because we have such a wide base of engineers right that's pretty amazing i would say solana ra ran its hackathon uh, last year and this year as well Yo, uh, I think that, have you seen the new ad which they yeah. were as worked on? Yeah, that was amazing. They had Johnny Lever, yeah. right? They make amazing, <laughs> fantastic ads. So Solana Hackathon, I think India had most number of applicants there. So yeah, I mean, crypto community in India is thriving. Good to see the focus on innovation and not the price action. So now let's shift the focus back to the other unicorn, uh, one card. Now, RBI has been coming down heavily against all of these BNPL companies, right? For example, Slice, which earlier used to say that you have three credit-free installments for three months but right now they have also started charging interest yeah see this whole bnpl or buy now pay later phenomena is interesting and important 
right in a country like india which is so famously credit starved obviously you know alternate forms of uh, financing and credit are super important right i mean and you know whether it is a slice or a uni or the others uh, the around they're essentially functioning as new age credit cards right i mean pretty much that's what they are india has i don't know less than 3% yeah. people own credit cards and ac- acquiring a credit card means i mean you qualify on multiple different things right credit score and you know profile and so on and so forth whereas i mean if you look at the new age folks i mean they are open to pretty much all and while it is important and while it is interesting i also feel that there is need for regulation because it can quickly go out of hand i mean if you look at us or china i mean this this concept of a payday loan and so on and people being trapped in this cycle of debt is very real right i mean you have huge debt trap in the developed countries so i feel there is need for regulation and i hope that the rbi works with these different entities to fight the ambiguity and help them understand why policy and regulation is important right because see in my experience entrepreneurs would much rather have that clarity and work with the government or the policy makers than sort of bypass these and work outside of the system right because that's the only long term kind of sustainable way to do business it's definitely going to affect these folks because what essentially the rbi has said is that they've essentially banned it i mean they've said that you can't offer credit lines through pre- prepaid payment instruments or ppis right. pretty much all of them have this you know pay one third or Pay in three yeah. unsta- I mean, also, installments or four installments kind of a thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. If you look at like how the entire BNPL story started in India was because of lockdown, right? There were people who were struggling with liquid cash, not having access to credit. That's where this entire concept of BNPL actually bloomed. Yeah. But right now, as the economy is stabilizing, okay, things are getting back to normal. How would these entities start making money? See, it's an irreversible change, right? And if you look at some of the more developed economies, I mean, this is a very mature sort of a sector. I mentioned payday loans, for yeah. example, and it's interesting. If you folks are, you know, into that, I mean, just go check out payday loans and the whole phenomena in the US. It's you'll go down a rabbit hole. So it's an irreversible change, and it's something that is actually beneficial because I did mention that you know people are. extremely credit starved but a lot of the credit in this case goes into funding consumption right i mean it's not that someone is uh, getting this loan to invest in a business or start something on the side or you know maybe invest in their education or so it's probably going for a new set of speakers or you mm, know sneakers yeah. or headphones or whatever right which is i mean again no judgment right i mean go and get that thing to improve the quality of your life and enjoy it right no worries at all but it can very easily go out of hand like i said it's important but it's important enough that it's regulated also you don't want 15 16 year olds or maybe 18 year olds or even 21 year olds paying 16 17% interest right so india has something like 20 to 25 million people who avail these various bnpl schemes you know huge portion of this is obviously very young people and we also talk about financial literacy and how it's very very low in india you don't want a bunch of these people being saddled with these loans and you know falling into that debt trap right yeah i mean it is important and important for regulation to kind of catch up and help these folks uh, work their way through so in this ongoing calendar year we have had close to 20 venture capital firms that have announced their new fund focusing on india and southeast asia the latest one to join that list is lightspeed venture partners they raised around 7 billion dollars across different funds globally and for india they have earmarked 500 million dollars in investments for early stage startups in both india and southeast asia now with a 500 million dollar fund the company will deepen its commitment to early stage startups in india and southeast asia region and continue to back growth stage companies in the region from its select and opportunity fund vehicles they've already backed companies like oyo byju's grab aqua rezape uran and innovaxa but you know with this whole conversation around funding winter and everything going on and like you know money drying up in the ecosystem we have 20 vc firms that have announced a new fund see people are not going to store their cash under their pillows right i mean it's not going to happen they're going to have to invest that's something that people will have to realize and this money is going to flow into different assets instruments economies one way or the other people freak out about fiis or foreign in- institutional investors selling so much but they're also buying right in record numbers so this buy and sell i mean it keeps happening and see the india startup story is a genie in a bottle situation right i mean we've mentioned this over and over and over again for the second or third largest startup ecosystem in the world depending on which report you pick up you know we attract about 6% of the venture capital money in the world right so we still have a long long way i mean in in perspective i mean the amount of capital that flows into india is not really that much right and these folks again lightspeed sequoia axel prime axelor i mean these are folks who are investing 
through multiple stages right i mean the investing in the early stage and the growth stage as well right. and early stage at least will will definitely not slow down and give it a while i think even growth stage funding will pick up right because <laughs> truth is that irrespective of financial cycles i mean vcs have to deploy cash and all these folks will have to deploy cash in the next 3 to 4 years i would say i mean this is the norm i mean you will see plenty of this happen Yeah, I think there was this article in Crunchbase as well, right? I think the slowdown for funding has happened for companies which are in the later stages or yeah, the cusp yeah. of profitability or going yeah. public. And uh, cash for this group has fallen close to thirty-one percent quarter on quarter in Q two, and thirty-eight percent year on year. That means VC firms are also being more mindful of okay, if you're investing in a company, how soon are they? being able to return profit see i mentioned that funds have to deploy irrespective of financial cycles right i mean they don't have that luxury of saying hey i'm going to sit out for the you know couple of years and then i'm going to come in later right which is again feature not a bug right that's how mm-hmm. it is so a lot of these folks had to invest in 2021 at some crazy crazy valuation you saw saas for example 60x 70x right i mean shopify was at some ridiculous valuation right mm-hmm. i mean all of those valuations have been like cut in half right less than half i mentioned klarna you know a little while earlier klarna has come down from a valuation of 46 billion dollars to 6 billion dollars it's like an 85% uh, mm. cut in the valuation so i think senior heads are sort of operating right now i think reason will always prevail over the long term and so yeah i mean you're going to see these people deploy these funds at more reasonable valuations right i mean mm. saas is already down to 10x multiples right now so yeah All right. So, talking about SaaS, Detect Technology has pocketed twenty-eight million dollars in primary and secondary funding, which was led by Process Ventures. Detect provides cloud-based applications to industries to automate and enhance the visibility of industrial risks and improve productivity. Existing investors Axel and Elevation Capital also participated in this round. Detect is also a product of IIT Madras, right? And IIT Madras has produced a couple of interesting startups. Naming some on top of my head is uh, Zoho, Ather, to Zetwork, to Agnikul. Yeah, so I think Chandra Shrikant uh, made this point uh, last week on uh, t- uh, Twitter, Rich. I mean, of course, I mean she works at uh, Money Control and does some pretty amazing work. So she interviewed uh, Amrit of Zetwork, and he was saying that you know, I mean, there's something in the water, right? IIT Madras always like produces these kind of folks, right? Who do slightly offbeat things, right? Zetwork, for example, yeah. in manufacturing, Agni Cool in space, and these folks as well. Um, Detect Technologies uh, operates in this whole NDE space, which is a non-destructive evaluation space. And the whole idea is, how can I use ultrasound or X-rays to really detect threats in a structure, right? And uh, these folks met at IIT Madras. A few of them were at uh, you know the refinery at Jamnagar, where. In fact, I also worked for a very brief time <laughs> before I came <laughs> running back to startups in Bangalore, where I saw Golden Compass, the English Nicole Kidman movie dubbed in Hindi. <laughs> That's the largest refinery in the world, by the way. Jamnagar. Yeah, one of the largest, if not the largest. And so these folks work there, and man, these refineries are daunting places from a safety perspective, right? I mean, you enter the refinery, and the first thing that greets you is a sign that says X days since accident, right? And I was, I mean, imagine like. Of being a fresh recruit, getting into this place and then noticing that the first day, right, some forty days since accident or something, and I spent the afternoon trying to figure what this accident was. So apparently, mm-hmm. someone. Good, had, you came back to Bangalore, bro. Oh, no regrets <laughs> at all, right? I mean, someone had burned his hand or something like that. So these kind of things happen, and safety is of the utmost importance in all of these places, right? I mean, you're talking about uh, obviously really explosive. flammable stuff also fuels the are duty machinery also that's there i mean huge the machinery them, I mean, structure i mean the the fuel is sto- stored at some 200 or 250 degrees celsius and so on i mean one of the the most intimidating moments for me was climbing up on top of these tanks right i mean and these tanks are they're not firm right i mean it it kind of feels like a like a wobbly structure right i mean it's a it's a plastic it's a high yeah. quality grade plastic or some other kind of material right metal or whatever it is and so i was on top of the structure and there was this other guy who was jumping on it just to show that hey you won't go you won't sink inside right yeah i mean uh, my heart was in my mouth like those telebrand ads you know where they like do those durability testing exactly so i mean i i Yeah. So enough said. I mean, safety is of utmost importance in these places, and you know, remotely kind of measuring this is ultimately uh, the future, right? I mean, we saw when we spoke about drones, for instance, right? right? I mean, figuring out uh, what are the threats and so on and then also using drones. robots for cleaning robots uh, for, for cleaning and so on so, so yeah i mean it's fantastic to see you know deep tech and r&d get the kind of uh, recognition and the funding that it truly deserves okay so moving on let's talk about some of the mergers and acquisitions from the week healthtech platform empine merged with life cells internationals 
Lifestyles is a stem cell bank and a reproductive genetic testing service provider. Together, they formed this new entity called LifeWell. The new entity also secured a $80 million investment from OrbiMed, which is a leading healthcare investment firm. EdTech Unicorn Upgrad snapped up Wolf's India, which is a recruitment and staffing firm for an undisclosed amount. Wolf's India specializes in placing tech talent across startups along with mid and large size organizations in both India and abroad. Digital healthcare startup Medibuddy acquired the online doctor consultation platform Kleenex for an undisclosed amount. The acquisition is expected to help Medibuddy expand its reach into the rural part of the country as Kleenex primarily caters to the rural population with a network across 20 tier 3 and tier 4 cities. Now this is interesting like how in the lockdown urban cities got so used to like teleconsultations and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Now these technologies are now penetrating to the rural parts of the country as well. So Medibuddy is actually sister concern or an affiliate of MediAssist which is a third party administrator or a TPA as is known in the insurance circles. and. Medibuddy basically has a bunch of these health and care services, right? And uh, what they are really trying to do is like extend their services to multiple different things. So they had uh, earlier merged with Docs app as well to extend their uh, healthcare services. And Clinic seems to have more of a focus on the rural side of things, right? So yeah, I mean, very interesting. And as you mentioned, post COVID, this whole uh, innovation in healthcare yeah. has peaked. Definitely something to look out for. The other one is uh, Upgrad acquiring Wolves India, right? Now we saw, I think, I think it was beginning of the year we saw this entire you know the great resignation going on yeah right how do you think recruitment or staffing in general has changed over this past few months see in india at least you can't uh, divorce education from employment right most people study to get jobs and be gainfully employed and upgrad has uh, you know has been at it for about eight ten years now right uh, in terms of offering courses data science analytics their own version of mba and so on and so forth right so i mean it kind of makes the sense for them to have a staffing function as well so that they can place the candidates that they train and uh, teach and it's interesting because the staffing is not just for india but also for abroad i think okay. the demand for indian engineers will only rise you know and especially with whatever is happening in Ukraine you know their demographic out of the picture right now in terms of an employment perspective it's only going to rise right I mean the interest in Indian engineers is only going to rise and yeah I mean Indian startups will have to fight that much harder I suppose but great for engineers you know yeah. and a lot of these folks are holding down you know two or three jobs actually which is crazy but hey if you can do it then more power to you I suppose Good time to be an engineer. Fantastic time to be an engineer. <laughs> All right. So in other funding news, we had uh, mental health platform Visa raised $20 million from Health Quad, British International Investment, W Health Ventures and K Capital. Uh, Roshan, I think we also had Joe Agarwal of Visa in the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, so we had uh, Joe on the podcast, I mean, sometime back, I think probably a year back, I suppose. Yeah. And uh, Visa is super interesting, right? Uh, both Joe and Ram have interesting backgrounds. They were corporate executives who kind of quit to focus on mental health and wellness. And, you know, there is a lot of stigma attached to talking about these things. And Visa is making it easier for people to get help on this front. They've also got a partnership with the U uh, healthcare systems, the NHS and, and so on, to really help those who are in need. They were recognized by the uh, by Google as well as one of the best initiators or one of the best uh, startups in the ecosystem. Great startup, great product, uh, and really excited about, you know, whatever they're going to do in the future. So if you haven't already, definitely go check out that episode with Joe Agarwal of Visa. We had a very interesting conversation on how do you build product around this, right? I mean, and it's you have to be very sensitive as well. You can't really gamify these things. You have to build a lot of empathy as well uh, within the product and so on. So wonderful episode. We'll probably link to it in the description. Do check it out. Okay, so I think today's talk of town really aptly summarizes uh, the discussion we had. And this is a tweet by Jason Lemkin. VC isn't struggling because we are in a massive recession. We aren't. VC is struggling because it paid very high valuations for two years and assume the next round would come at an even higher va valuation and quickly. Those assumptions have been proven wrong. Yeah, I mean, just for sanity's sake, I think we should all erase 2021 from our memories. It was the bull run of bull runs and it was a glorious exception. So don't use that as a benchmark at all, right? I feel bad for VCs in a way because as I said, I mean, they have to deploy irrespective of these funding cycles. And last year, I often referenced this article called Playing Different Games by Everett Randall of the Founders Fund, where he spoke about how Tiger changed the game, right? With their speed of uh, uh, funding and so on. And, and so, you know, I mean, it's it just par for the course, right? 
right? I mean, now that you have this kind of correction, well, I mean, things have to be tempered. All those valuations are not valid anymore. And so on a relative term, it feels like, okay, I mean, it's a humongous crash, which it is. But in absolute terms, I feel like, you know, there is still a lot more optimism compared to, you know, some of the, you know, previous recessions that have happened, right? I mean, whether it's the dot-com bust or uh, the 2008 financial crisis and I certainly was very much around I was working in the you know 2008 2009 time and it was way way worse I mean it was it was tangible right right now people talk about you know inflation being high uh, in 9 percent in the US which is crazy absurd 7 percent in India and uh, you talk about the stock market crash and all of these things and sure I mean if it does affect you but really I, I don't know maybe it was the time that I experienced it or whatever I just feel that 2008 was way, way worse. I mean, it was like a proper recession. I think smarter people would have pulled up numbers uh, and done the comparison. But I feel that, you know, at this point of time, it's not really all that bad in comparison. Well, I hope it doesn't get any worse either. <laughs> you know, I mean, I want to end on something profound, right? It'll get a lot worse before it gets better. All right, let's talk about some of the episodes. Have you brushed up on your data science courses? Not yet. I mean, uh, I was not particularly fond, fond of statistics or, or math at that point of time. But uh, yeah, I'll be talking to Deepak, who is the chief uh, data scientist at Blackbuck. And interesting background for sure. And data science is, again, a very finite skill set, right? There are not a lot of folks uh, in that uh, space, uh, within India at least, extremely highly sought after. We spoke about engineering salaries. Well, yeah. data science <laughs> folks are... The alpha of the alpha, right? But in all seriousness, it'll be interesting to understand how they use data to sort of optimize their execution. You know, Blackbuck runs one of the largest trucking networks in India, yeah. and they've used technology to completely revolutionize this sort of an old world business. So it should make for a very interesting conversation. Also, in addition to that, we are going to put out a first of our explainer videos on industrial policies and startups in context. So if there's any particular topic that you would like us to explore first, do leave them in the comments below. So the in context series is a a pet project that I've had in mind for quite a while now and hopefully we'll you know execute on that soon enough but the idea is to talk about how industrial policy and government policy making in general impact startups right and startup innovation at that we could talk about profit linked incentives how it impacts startups or why is the government promoting EV and how that impacts uh, startups through all of these uh, fame subsidies and so on or even the account aggregators network or the ONDC that uh, you know we've uh, talked about earlier the idea is to you know talk about this simple way that is under by everyone so you understand you know how much of an impact some of these uh, things have right i mean i always say that we're not talking about some of these things enough right and that's just the way the media works i suppose there are blaring headlines every week and if you look back at some of these things over the course of a year hardly one or two things would be really important right i think the really really important things get hidden often and one of those things is the whole digital revolution in india right and all of the policies and measures that i spoke about so yeah we will be talking about these in the time to come we'll publish the first of it perhaps next week and if you like it let us know we'll do more of it and also uh, to be notified when these episodes are out please do follow us on our social media handles on twitter it's operator startup and on linkedin it's the startup operator to let us know how we have done on this episode please do leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and also refer this to your other operator friends so that's all for this week and we'll be back with more headlines to discuss next week see you soon thanks everyone have a great week